give you all a little background on where the information that I'm going to teach y'all came from. So, um, this is the trauma kit here that we are building here at the store. It's one of our pre-made kits. It's uh, something that we're kind of delving into now. Uh, we've got pre-made go bags and survival bags and things of that nature. Um, the first thing you're going to notice about the bag is it's bigger than most of your little EMT bags you'll see that most people are putting on their backpacks or putting on their vests. Um, that's because it's a rip away. This is designed to carry more uh, tools for the trade than what you usually use on a typical IFAC. Um, this is more for uh, either a really big medical bag that you're going to carry with you when you're going out on your adventures or in a survival situation or to carry extra gear to work on somebody else. Um, I actually have one of these that I keep on the headrest of my vehicle uh, as a response bag to get out so I don't have to drag my big old stomp to medical bag everywhere. Um, so it separates from the base so you can attach this to a uh, molly patch or, or a pad on your seat or you can do it on bags, vests, whichever you like. Uh, and it just separates right off of there. First thing you're going to see up here, you got all the molly up front. So if you need to weave any tools or anything that you'd like to have readily accessible, um, i.e. your cat tourniquets or any type of tourniquets that you carry, the soft tees, whichever you like to use. Uh, I like having my trauma shears up front because pocket knives work great, but a good set of trauma shears keeps you from cutting other people, causing uh, more injuries to the patient that you're working on. So trauma shears right up front. Now there's two ways of wrapping cat tourniquets, okay? Who does not know what a cat tourniquet is? All right, a good number of people. Right. This is the CAT tourniquet or the cat tourniquet. Um, it stands for Combat Application Tourniquet. This is standard issue in the United States Army right now. Um, the reason that they use this one is because it's extremely simple. You can use it on yourself, and a lot of times in a intense situation or in a firefight, your buddies can't get to you to work on you. You have to do what they call self-aid. So you've got to turn it off, whatever, or start patching wounds and things of that nature. Um, I don't foresee anybody here really getting into a firefight, but if you have questions about medicine in that aspect, come and talk to me. I'll talk to you all offline about that. Um, but there's two ways of doing it. The easiest way that I have found, um, and some of my combat medic buddies uh, like to do it, is when you fold it up. This is all double-sided Velcro. All right, so it sticks to itself. Um, easy, I do it this way because I can actually put it into my molly webbing. You have two slots in your buckle. All right, and we'll go over why you have two separate ones here in a little bit. But you can take one of these sticks here and put it through there, and then this back one you actually use to weave on your molly. So when you need to get to it, all you have to do, like let's say it's on your vest, is pull down and it separates this piece from here, and then pull up and out, and you have your tourniquet in your hand separated from your gear without having to take anything off. Or have to sit there and use two hands because one arm might be immobilized or like. The other way, which is the way that most of these come, when you get them out of the package, it's like this. In theory, this is a great idea until you start trying to figure out how to carry it uh, or try to figure out how to put it in your gear where it's easily accessible. Um, if you have a carrier for your cats, like they actually make separate cat tourniquet carriers, uh, they're actually as expensive as the cat tourniquets are, so that's why I do it the other way. Um, the one advantage to this is I do not have to run it through this before I can use it. This is already set up, so I can take this and put it on my arm and pin it, and I can already use it. Uh, but we're going to go over that in the hands-on, how to actually use this on yourself and different techniques and tricks. Uh, past that, cat tourniquets is probably the best way to go. Um, soft tees are okay. Uh, those are the metal version of this. They also have the rip cords out there that are very similar to them. Um, they're a little bit more expensive, but they're all metal, so you have a little bit more weight. What I like about the cats is that this plastic windlass, after time, anything plastic is going to degrade, especially from UV exposure. If it's on your gear or getting wet and dry all the time, especially if it's on like, your pack if you're going out on your trips. Uh, if this breaks or one side of this breaks, you can still lock it into the clip with just one side. Also, you can take a pin or a screwdriver or a bar or whatever and put it through the piece that the windlass is on, and now you have an improvised windlass. You can add to it find a big stick if that's all that's around you and that'll work too. So there's different ways to use them, but we'll get into that in a little bit. Alright, so let's open this up. See what we got playing in here. Alright. Now the way that I set this up on the inside is for ease of use. Um, 
basically your steps that you're going through when you are treating an actual casualty as opposed to assessing, okay? Assessment's a completely different thing that we would have to cover in another class. But when you get to the treatment aspect, having your gear organized the way that you like to work is the most important part, all right? The way I have this organized is how I like to work and how a couple of my buddies that we all hang out, a couple of them are medics, um, this is how we set our gear up so that any, any, any one of us can go to somebody's IFAC and if I grab uh, John Boy's IFAC or Steven's IFAC or whoever, I know how it's set up. It's set up all exactly the same. So when I'm reaching in there, it doesn't matter if it's in the dark. I know where his stuff's at and I can grab it. So if you're putting together teams or groups, consider that. Consider getting your gear set up the same way. Um, but if you want, uh, if y'all want to build your own kits, we can get the stuff together and, and y'all can bring it in what you already have. We can add to it and I can sit down with y'all and go over and we can go with your strong points and how you like to work. Some people like to work left to right. Some people like to work right to left. Me personally, I like to go straight to the center and then have my add-ons on the outside. So, uh, as that being said, the meat and potatoes of this bag is right here in the center, okay? The first thing that I would, I would grab for in this bag would be the big old ABD pad, right? This is a five inch by nine inch gauze pad, essentially. It's high absorbent, it soaks up everything. Moisture, blood, you name it, this is gonna soak it up, okay? So I use this for either small wounds like abrasions or cuts on the skin, um, and also for wound assessment and, and uh, initial response to it. So if somebody's bleeding on the leg, first thing I'm grabbing out is an ABD pad, and I'm gonna wipe it down and see what I'm working with, see how deep it is or how severe it is, and then I'm gonna push it right on top of it and put pressure down. Now, I have, now I'm already applying direct pressure while I'm formulating what I'm gonna do to treat this casualty. Okay. Any questions so far? Am I going too fast? No, it's good. All right, cool. So I'm assessing my casualty. I'm looking. Put that down. Okay. The first thing I'm either going to go to next is I'm either going to pack this wound if it's severe enough, or I'm going to wrap it up if it's a surface, a surface abrasion, or I'm putting a tourniquet on it one way or the other. All right. So the first thing I'm going to go to next is usually going to be my Israeli dressing. All right. I'm not going to open this one up, but I'm going to open up one of these guys to show you what this is. Uh, Israeli dressing is a, let's think of the easiest way to put this. Everybody knows what an ace bandage is, right? Those long stretchy bandages. It's an ace bandage with one of these on it. All right, big old pad, absorbent blood absorbent pad right on it with a tension clip, all right? They're really easy to use. They've even got instructions on the outside. So uh, if you're working with people who don't have as much experience as you and you haven't had time to teach them yet, you can toss them this thing and say, hey, read the instructions or look at the pictures. You don't even have to read it. It's stupid, simple to be able to use it. So rip them open. They're usually double sealed. A little vacuum pack here. So the first thing, as soon as you open it up, these things are designed to be used right off the bat. Right? Um, these were designed in conjunction with the Israeli Defense Forces uh, and military personnel to be used in combat situations. So. Hail of bullets going around, you don't have time to be fumbling with your hands. All right? In any high stress situation, if somebody is really bleeding, you don't have time to be fumbling with your hands. So they prepackage this stuff ready to go. First thing is this is in a wad together and it's sealed up nice and secure. And the first thing you have is that big pad that I just told you all about. All right? So right off the bat, I can go from here and bam, I've got that pad on there and I've got pressure. And I can start to wrap it up. All right? So, let's do, um, yeah, the way they actually do this is they have a piece of string that's sewn into it that just breaks loose as you go. So that way it keeps it together so when you're wrapping, you don't get this far, you're like starting your wrap and all of a sudden this is all over the place. It's in your hand and it unfolds as you go. All right? Again, keeping things simple. We lose all our minor motor functions when things go to hell in a handbasket. All right, you have your securing tension bar on the end. That's for securing it at the end so you don't have to sit there and try to tuck it and it's coming loose or try to find something to tie it down. Um, and then you also have this. This is your tension clip. This is the most important part of this Israeli bandage. This determines how you're going to use it, all right? You can use this not only as just a wrapping bandage, let's say you just had a, a minor burn or some kind of cut abrasion on your arm. You can also use this almost as a tourniquet. Right. It's designed to be a pressure bandage, but you can tighten this thing down so tight, and we'll go over that in the hands-on portion, you can actually make this into a turn for just about. All right. Where are you?
where did Robert? Hey, hey, how are you doing? Good to see you. You look great. I want to show you this real quick while I'm on it. Absolutely. Okay. Oh, you can everything I can. All I need is all. All right, so we're going to teach you about this clip real quick. All right. So let's say he's got a cut, just a basic cut on his arm, right? All I have to do is put that pad right on it and wrap. And I can just completely bypass this clip and not worry about it if I'm just wrapping up a small wound. Now, if he's got a major bleed there, or an arterial bleed or something like that. Let's say I don't have a tourniquet. Uh, who's familiar with the old, has anybody ever seen an old World War II movie when they use those combat bandages, the big green thing with the white pad in the middle? Okay, you ever notice how they always wrapped up the white first? You want to do the same thing here. You want to do one wrap on the bottom to secure that edge, um, and one wrap across the top to secure this side. That's for two reasons. One, security of the bandage, and two, sterility of the wound. You don't want dirt and all kinds of mud and all kinds of other crap getting up in there and into the wound and actually giving you a bad infection. All right. Now from here, this is where you decide whether you can use it as a pressure dressing or if you're just going to wrap it. Okay. So let's say he's got a really bad bleed and I want to put some pressure on this thing to actually wrap it down. There's two ways of doing it. This clip's got a little slot right there. You're going to take the edge of this and just pull it right into it. Okay. Now we're in the tension clip. Now, two things you can do. You can wrap straight back on itself, which is going to create that pressure for you. Or if you've got a really bad bleed, I don't have a tourniquet, and I really need to stop the blood flow as much as I can, instead of going across the middle, you're actually going to go down into the corner and pull it down like that. It's going to create a much higher tension point. And when you come back across, you're going to go back into the clip and come across the other way. So you're actually using this piece of plastic as a press into his arm. All right. So you're actually cut, pushing down on that just like you will with the tourniquet and restricting that blood flow as much as possible if we have a heavy bleed. All right. And then we just, you just wrap it off, and then we use those ends I just showed you right here. And we'll go over it in the hands-on part, and it just slips right onto the edge of this, and it locks in. All right. So they're real simple to use, and they really do help save a lot of lives. It's something you can do just about anything with. Now, as easy as he did that, if any of you that were close up could actually see the veins in my hands were actually starting to pop up. It really wasn't that much tension, but it was enough to uh, get my veins in there. Oh, yeah. Pretty cool. Like I said, you can use it like a turkey. Probably the best in a hurry. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so you've got two of those in this kit, two six inches. They make a four inch. The smaller ones, a lot of guys prefer these for the gunshot wounds because they're easier to handle with just doing them on yourself. Uh, and most of your uh, combat sustained injuries from gunfire are not going to be a wide open wound. That's going to be more like an explosion or a broken limb or something like that. So a lot of guys prefer the fours. I always go with sixes because I can do anything I can do with a four with a six. And I can do stuff I can't do with a four with a six. So I err on the side of caution about all of my gear set up. So you've got two of those. You got four of these bad boys for assessing different wounds and wrapping up. Um, and then next, you're going to decide whether you're going to pack this wound or you're just going to wrap it up and secure it. All right? So let's say we decided we've got a big gash in the leg and we really need to pack some gauze into this wound and get some pressure in there and stop the bleeding. You have these guys here, which everybody here has seen like roller gauze, right? Well, the, uh, all the medical personnel in the hospitals and stuff use uh, roller gauze on steroids. It's four and a half yards long uh, and about three to four inches wide, depending on what you get. Okay, This is all of that vacuum sealed right, into a very tiny, small package. You can carry a lot of this, and this is really, really good for packing wounds. We'll open one of these up and show you what this is. This is one of the three inch ones. So this is already rolled up for you. All right. Uh, the hands on portion, I'll actually show you how to pack a wound, uh, how to move your fingers and the little tricks that you can do to make it easier on yourself. Um, but you have just a roll of a whole lot of gauze. So you can really get in deep and pack a, uh, a heavy bleeding wound really tight and it helps us, uh, to stop that bleeding and secure it. Uh, there's two of those in there. And then the other option with the kit, as long as we're still talking about the kit here, you can go one of two ways. 
Uh, quick clot. Um, everybody here's probably heard of quick clot before. Uh, they used to use an old um, bag of powder. The problem with the powdered quick clot is it was not only burning the, the the victims that you're working on, all your patients, but it's also burning the person working on them. So the responder or the medic or whatever, because it clotted by heat, it actually sealed it up and cauterized the wound. It was activated by oxygen, and when it hit that blood, it just lit up and it wasn't an actual flame, but that's how it did it was with the heat. Uh, so when you put your hands on it, even if you've got gloves between you and it, you're going to get hurt. And if your hands are hurt, you can no longer help yourself or anybody else. All right. So they went to this kind of stuff. This uses a, uh, a hemostatic agent like a powder. Um, so there's no heat at all with this. And we've actually gone, in the Army at least, we've gone to the quick gauze. This is the same thing as this, but with a hemostatic agent. All right. So this is a vacuum sealed gauze, just like this, but it's got a powdered hemostatic agent in there for clotting up blood. Okay. If you're packing a wound, I heavily suggest getting this stuff. It can be expensive, but this stuff can really save somebody's life. This is awesome if you have a really bad wound. Um, for minor wounds or outside wounds, or even a heavy bleeder, this is just a, uh, what they call a sponge, a quick clot sponge. Um, it looks like a little three by three inch piece of gauze with the same hemostatic agent in it. So basically you just press this into the wound and hold pressure and then you would pack this in on top of it. Okay, this is a whole roll of that. So uh, when you're setting up your gear, I mean, it's obviously personal preference, but uh, my personal preference is the combat gauze. I've got loads and loads of this stuff in every one of my kids. So that's your heavy bleeding control. Um, and then past that, no trauma kit or first aid kit is complete without a triangle bandage. Uh, it's a big old triangle piece of fabric you can use to make slings. Um, when we get into the hands-on portion, I'm actually going to use a couple of them to show you guys how to make an improvised tourniquet if we have time. Um, which, if you have any kind of cloth, you can use to do that. But we're going to use cravat because it makes life easy. Um, so cravats are great things to have. Uh, I usually have two of them in all my gear. And then in this kit with the tape, tape is always, always important. Um, I'm not a big fan of just surgical tape. I like duct tape because duct tape sticks to everything, whether it's blood covered or not. Um, but uh, surgical tape does work too. Uh, if you see here, you'll see how I have this on a piece of 550 cord. All right, that's for two reasons. One, like we were talking about earlier, high stress situation, your pulse is running, your adrenaline's running, your buddy's sitting there bleeding, or your wife, girlfriend, uh, son, daughter sitting there bleeding. When you open this thing up, the tape's going to go flying. If you have it tucked down in a pocket, it's going to be a pain in the butt to get out. This keeps it from going anywhere. And if, let's say, I just need a, a little piece of tape to stick onto something to secure some of my work on the patient, all you got to do is find the end, and it stays in place. Right. The other thing about it is it's tied together with a square knot. Everybody here know what a square knot is? Who doesn't know what a square knot is? OK. We can show you guys how to do that later. Uh, it's a very simple knot. Um, but the basis of it is it's very easy to undo. So if you need to take this off and wrap it around a wound or wrap it around somebody's arm to secure something, uh, all you do is push it together and it comes apart. Just like those old Chinese finger, uh, finger traps, you just push them together and your fingers would come out. Same idea with a square knot. Uh, that just makes your life easy. Um, now a couple of things that I omitted from this kit. Uh, tension pneumothorax equipment as far as like a punctured lung or a sucking chest wound where you actually have air coming into the chest cavity and creating pressure inside of your chest. Uh, big problem. Um, your chest works off of negative pressure internally. Okay. Uh, it literally takes the amount of pressure it takes for you to touch the skin of your two fingers together. That's how much pressure it takes to stop your heart. So if you actually touch something, someone's heart like that, boom, done. You've upset the sinus rhythm and it is not going to keep beating. You're going to have to restart it. Okay, so when you have pressure coming in through a wound in the chest, it's actually going to, you're going to start seeing the trachea move to the side, not affected by the injury. It's going to be going to the side where it's getting air. Because nine times out of ten, you either have a punctured lung and a hole in that sac, or you have too much pressure coming in that way and that lung is collapsing. Okay, so you can see, you're going to see that trachea start to move to the side without the injury. So if I get hit here and everything in the inside of my chest is moving this way, it's going into my heart. And if I don't treat that very quickly okay, and relieve that pressure, <laughs> heart's going to stop and there's nothing on, well, in the military, there's nothing on the battlefield I can do. All I can do is treat the signs and symptoms I see and try to prevent that from happening. But once that's happened, there's nothing I can do. Okay, so in some of the high stress situations and a survival situation, 
you may not have that option either, so it's very important you get on it quickly. Um, but because of the training it takes to use some of those aids, uh, there's some needles involved and different things like that. I do not have that in this kit. Uh, some of the stuff we're not even allowed to sell um, because there's no doctor over us. We're not actually training that. Um, but I can did include some stuff that you can use to treat those types of injuries until you can get to higher care. Um, and a couple little tricks that are really easy to do. You don't really need that much information to do it. Um, these are just plain old emergency water bags for you guys that are familiar with the store. We brought these in last year sometime. Any piece of plastic or inclusive material will work. A piece of an MRE bag, a piece of a food bag, um, a Ziploc bag, a piece of that. Anything that's like a plastic that's not going to allow air pressure to, to come through it. Any kind of impermeable that holds water, usually you're good. Um, well, let me not say that because there are some waterproof fabrics out there that let air through. Um, so plastic is the key to it. Uh, it's called an occlusive dressing, which means it doesn't allow any pressure in. But what it does do is it allows pressure out. So you're allowing that pressure that's building up in the chest that's coming in from the blood that's filling that cavity to escape. But you're not allowing air to come in when the person's trying to inhale. Because when they inhale, they're bringing that pressure in from the ear as well as through their nose and mouth. So that's what's creating that overload of pressure along with the blood flowing if you have something nicked inside. Okay? All you're going to do is take a piece of this and you want to make sure it's just going to cover the wound up pretty well. Um, and it just you cut it to fit. Uh, the less material that you're working with, the better. So you don't really want to fold one of these in half. It just becomes too cumbersome. Uh, but you can cut one of these right across the top with the shears or with a pocket knife. And then take your tape, and you're going to tape it. Uh, there's two ways you can do it. Uh, you can tape it on three sides, or you can tape it down to one corner and leave one corner open. That's going to allow that pressure to, uh, to flow out. They call it a flutter valve. Because it will literally sit there and flood like a whoopee cushion. When, when they exhale and that pressure's coming out, it's just going to sit there and flutter that valve. And then when they inhale, that plastic that's going to be soaked in uh, fluid and blood and stuff like that, it's going to stick right back to the skin. And when they inhale, no pressure is going to come back into the chest. So you're actually minimizing further damage as well as possibly prevent or, uh, helping to relieve damage that's already there. Okay. Um, the way we do it uh, in the Army is actually with needles and a full-on occlusive dressing. Um, we actually have uh, seals that are like a giant piece of uh, flypaper and duct tape mixed together on steroids. It sticks to everything, hair, blood, it doesn't matter. Um, and you just put it right over the wound and there is nothing coming in or out of that. And then we actually use a needle to uh, go in and relieve that pressure. And we can cap them off and open them back up depending on how the patient is uh, reacting to the treatment and what the situation is. Um, but that takes a little bit more of advanced training. Um, so the flutter valve is the easiest way and the most basic way to do it. Uh, it's been trained in the first responder classes and your basic a uh, little bit higher level first aid classes forever, for a long time. Um, and between this and turn or between occlusive dressings and tourniquets, there's been a lot, a lot of lives saved, uh, both in uh, the civilian world and uh, on, on the battlefield. So you're just preventing a whole lot of bad things from going downhill really quickly by reacting to the situation on that. So it's paramount that you're practicing with your gear and you're looking over stuff. Um, I actually have. Quite a bit of this. Uh, when my stuff starts to go outdated, I'll actually take it out of the packages so I have stuff to work with and play around with. And my, I won't call it my team, but my buddies and I actually will sit there and do mock drills with this stuff, reaching into somebody else's gear, reaching into our gear, and doing that kind of thing. So uh, it's set up real basic. It's real easy to use. Like I said, I can help you all set up your own uh, for what's going to work for y'all. Um, but past that, that's just about it as far as the kit goes. Um, Robert. So that's the kit explained in a nutshell. Okay. So, uh, does anybody have any questions about anything in the kit before we get into the hands-on portion? Well, great. <laughs> yes, sir. That first piece you had, um, you say you were uh, like somebody's bleeding. Mm -hmm. Before you know what you're going to do, try to formulate what you're going to do. You put that one piece on there, and then you brought out the. Uh, yeah, Talk that, about this, right? Yes, sir. They buy the uh, thing that you wrap around. Yes, sir. Just depending on the situation, would you have to combine the two? Probably not. Uh, actually, that's a really good question. I do. 
um, because the more layers of absorbent material you have between the outside and the inside is going to be less blood that's getting out and more pressure that's going to be actually on the wound. Um, did everybody hear his question? Okay. Um, so what I will usually do is I'm use, I use this for assessing and for, like I said, minor injury. But when I'm actually putting pressure in there on this, and sometimes I'll even use another body part to hold it down. If it's bleeding bad enough, I'll use my knee to hold it in place while I'm working with my gear. Um, but you can use that in conjunction with. And the other thing is, is this is what you're going to use if you have a really bad bleeder in the leg. Uh, disclaimer real quick, you never, never, never pack anything in the torso. You never pack a wound in the chest or the torso. You cover it up and you seek higher care. Right. If you pack anything into the torso, your organs are arranged, arranged in such a specific manner, you can cause damage. All right. So pass that. Um, you'll actually use this to hold this as you're packing in. You'll hold that in place with this piece and pack it into it. And then I just leave that right on top of it and wrap my Israeli dressing over the top. Fellas, how many questions? Okay. Thank you. Gloves and surgical gloves. There are surgical gloves in the kit. Matter of fact, there's one thing I forgot. There's a little CPR mask in here. So you don't have to go lip locking with anybody who you don't know what disease they have. Um, there are gloves inside of it. All right, gloves are very important. You don't know what diseases anybody else may or may not have. And hepatitis and all that kind of stuff that's blood borne, it can be a bad thing. So you can make, take a bad situation, especially in a survival situation, you can take a bad situation and turn it to a whole lot worse. All right, so thank you. Uh, but yes, there are gloves in the kit. Um, I can show you all a couple of tricks with, uh, Packing gloves and making them a lot smaller, and you get quite a few pairs. Um, it's disposable. Uh, it's just a little. I guess we can do this up too. This is just. I mean, you can sanitize it if it's a survival situation. You want to keep it around, but this is really just a disposable one. Just a piece of plastic that you can lay over. It's not going to allow any of their fluids to come through. A lot of times when you are giving CPR to somebody, what happens is you actually put air into their stomach and they vomit. That air creates pressure and they will actually vomit back out. And if you're lip locked with somebody and don't have one of these guys with a one-way valve and plastic, you are going to ingest all of that. And you will probably vomit right after. Um, but you just have a little one-way valve in here um, and it covers up and then you've got your gloves. So it's a very little basic seat trap kit. Keeping that in your vehicle or in the back of the interior area? Uh, the heat, you know, I don't ever use one of these. Um, I don't use smaller stuff like this. I've actually got a full on hand blue bag and such in my truck. Um, but it is just a basic, like, rubberized plastic. So over time, the heat is going to degrade it. Um, that's why I was saying, about what I was saying earlier, taking your gear out and playing with it and training with it often. You need to inspect your gear about once a month as well. You need to go through and make sure everything's still intact. You don't bring any breaks or problems with it and replace stuff that's deficient. You need to make sure you're keeping up with your maintenance of your gear. So, but yes, it will probably degrade in the heat. You don't carry a suture kit in here? Um... And a trauma bag? No. Um, that takes a little bit more of advanced skill. I mean, anybody who knows how to do a running cross stretch and finish it with an embroidery knot can do it. But, uh, a lot of times in areas that you're in, uh, stitching a wound is actually going to leave you open and prone to more infection than just going ahead and covering it up and packing it and getting to higher care or getting to a more sanitized situ area and situation where you can actually open it up and do that kind of stuff. Um, this is a uh, all out guns out trauma kit, you know, crap has hit the fan three times over and people are bleeding out and you need to start fixing yourself or your buddy. So that's what this is, this is made to hit, is your major bleeding and to try to prevent any further injury as quick as possible. And then past that, you move on to higher care, whether you've got a base camp set up in a survival situation, uh, you're out in the woods and you've got to get them transported to EMS or whichever, or you're on the side of the road. Um, this is made just to treat your basic immediate trauma. So. Any other questions before we hit the hands on? Is it too early to ask what kind of money is involved in that? Uh, this kit, as a basic as what I have set up here with the sponges and not the quick clot gauze, uh, runs between 120 and 135, um, and that's with everything that you see here put into it for the ABD pads, um, two of the packing gauzes, 
two quick pop sponges, two of the plastic bags, two to six inches. Same exact design. Uh, just a different company. That's pretty reasonable for all that equipment. And then past that, like I said, we can uh, uh, revamp it to fit your needs. So if you want the gauze as opposed to the sponges, it's going to raise the cost a little bit. Um, I do have flutter valve chest seals here um, that you can just slap on there um, and not have to worry about taping down on two or three sides, but those are a little bit more expensive as well. That's why they're not in the basic kit. Uh, but there are other things I carry here that we can add to and trade out. And that's going to affect the cost a little bit, but it's going to make your life a little bit easier. So. Is that it for the video, Robert? Uh, I believe so. I mean, always we always recommend as well, and this I, I would like to include. Uh, as always, with any time we've ever done anything, when we are speaking about first aid, I always encourage you strongly to go out and get additional training uh, elsewhere. You know, get certified. There's uh, city courses and things like this for first responders and things like that. Um, uh, what's the other one? The Y, that's the first aid stuff, I believe. And, uh, uh, yeah, YMCA, American Red Cross is one of your biggest ones out there. <coughs> So always look around and try to get additional training in first aid is very important. And if there's ever an emergency and you don't have time to get a first responder to you or they are occupied otherwise, uh, or one example that we were talking about is bleeding on the arm. If you slice your arm and you're in, uh, let's say on the hood of the car or some portion of the car, you get side railed on the car and get thrown off into a ditch, you get up and lift your hood, see what you can do, slice your arm, you're bleeding now out of an artery in your arm, you can pack yourself up. It's real important to know how to do it and have the gear to do it, but it's real important to know how to do it and what you're actually doing. So just uh, get additional training as usual. The more you pack in your head, the less you got to pack in your bag. So. Uh, but yeah, that's it. And then we're going to... Uh, continue on with the hands-on portion, anybody interested in actually doing this themselves to learn how to do it. Okay? Good job. Thanks, guys. Thanks.